Mr. Rainwater. Hey, Joe. All right. Tonight, we're not necessarily talking about inspiration because it, I, I feel like we've talked about inspiration as a topic before. Inspiration is a motivating factor, a kick in the ass, a end game, if you say, if you will. Mm. Uh, whereas, like, an inspiration could be. I want to make an audience jump out of their seat or I want them to fall over laughing or I want them to be bawling tears. Like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. that's a very uh, end end oriented. Tonight, I wanted to talk about Muse, like the idea from which creative ideas stem mm -hmm. in terms in service of that actual inspiration, that end game, that point. So it's like, OK, I want to make them cry. Well, how am I going to make that happen? You know sure. what I mean? So like, yeah. how do I, how does an artist come up with those particular creative approaches, the execution, the angles, the originality to some extent um, of, of what they're going to end up doing or, yeah. or how they're going to do something. So tonight we're talking about muses. I think I have already outed myself multiple times in our, in past episodes, but I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up again. Um, the majority of my, cause the, one of the things that I, I mean, I get compl complimented on a lot of things. I know what I don't get complimented on, but I know what I get complimented <laughs> on a lot. I get complimented on a lot on my set pieces and my dialogue. The dialogue, I can't really explain. Uh, I don't know. I just talk how I hear things in my head. Can I make and, a guess though? Sure. Cause I think you and, um, my friend Austin, I think have similar, strengths in in that department and i think it comes from an observational place maybe where i think a lot of times artists in particular are very sensitive to their surroundings and to their environment and they are not necessarily like fully conscious of all the stuff that they absorb and i mm. think that there's a lot of conversational stuff that happens probably around you that you kind of pick up on, or maybe you're listening in on people or whatever, and you make notes of little things, little like, you know what I mean? Like little um, particularities to people's speech patterns, to like words that people use, stuff like that. That that would be my guess. So in a way you're right, in a, in a way you're wrong. Uh I think it's a commonality amongst artists that all of us are, I don't want to say introverts and I don't want to say paranoid, but a lot of us feel like outsiders and like we don't fit, even when we're talking about amongst other artists. Yeah. And one of, I want to call it a defense mechanism that I know that I have developed is that I do listen to the particularities the tone, the inflection, the word choices that other people make when I'm in social situations, because nine times out of 10, I am trying to deduce what their motivation is in that moment. Yeah, not yeah. for not for a story type thing where it's like, oh, yeah, I'm yeah. just practicing my craft. It's like, no, I got to figure out what this guy wants because like I can figure out how, kind yeah, of thing. I, I'm trying I, to figure I, out how I respond and how yeah. I can a not make it awkward. B, get what I want. C determine whether or not I like this person. You know what I mean? Like yeah. there's, there's a fucking, yeah. Like you said, like a crime scene going on I in have my head. So, I've had, there's so many conversations where I've been in a restaurant and I'm just listening to people talk and I'm just like, what, where are they going with this? Like, what is the, yeah. Like, where is this leading and why is this person talking about this or that thing? You know? Right. So like when I'm, when I'm writing, I can hear the voices in my head because when I figure someone out in real life, I, I kind of assign, that personality or that speech and flight, like that yeah. speech pattern to, to a certain type. Uh, you know, there are people who are shysters as the word is where they're just smooth talking, trying to get what they mm -hmm. want and they don't care, but they'll say anything. And you kind of pick up on those patterns and there's people who are saying things cause they're just being polite, but they don't really think that like you kind of get used to that. So in my mind, like my wife, for example, 
I could say something. I could look at her and go, I know exactly what you're thinking right now. You are going to say this, then I'm going to say that, then you're going to say this, then I'm going to say that, then you're going to say this, and then we're going to do this. And then she'll look at me and just go, shut up, go away. Because (laughs) she's frustrated because we don't get to have the conversation because I already know how it's going to play out. So when I do my my writing, it's it's very instinctive. It's almost second nature for me to be able to fill in those things. Yeah. The other thing that I get complimented on the most is set pieces like my and, and this is where I think people credit me with being original to some extent is coming up with a setting a scenario, a, I want to, I don't want to say a gimmick, but an angle, so to speak on how things can be done a little bit differently. The weird part about this is, and I, this is the part that I've given out in the past and I don't know how it's helpful to anybody else, but nine times out of 10, when I have a really good scenario playing out or a moment or beat, whatever it may be, even just fucking in general, like a plot, Nine times out of ten, it comes from misheard song lyrics. <laughs> I'll be listening to a song. I'll hear lyrics. I'll think that's what they said. It's not yeah. what they said. Yeah, yeah. But then I'll go, oh, I see that. Blah, blah, blah. So there was uh, a, a song by In This Moment, right? And Jesus, I don't even know what the real words are. Oh, I, there are so many songs where I'm that way. Like... I I had to eventually like look at the lyrics cuz in my mind I had these things that didn't make sense when I like <laughs> would sing the lyrics to myself I'm like what is how does yeah. that even make sense like that doesn't that doesn't seem like you know how Rush would put that song together uh, Okay so there's a song by in this moment called Big Bad Wolf now oddly enough I did not know um what the name of this song was when I heard it, mm-hmm. okay, but the lyrics that I misheard were, pig, pig, would you let me in? Now, the way this is screamed in this song, somehow in my brain reverberated to, Kevin, will you let me out? <laughs> didn't, didn't, okay, so it was complete, almost completely opposite, will you let me in, will you let me out? Yeah. And the the irony of it be calling Big Bad Wolf is that when I heard that lyric in my head on the treadmill, I saw a scene of a werewolf behind bars in a little jail cell reaching out, threatening someone. And I wrote a scene in Haunted where there's a werewolf locked in a jail cell reaching out at somebody. And I said, well, fuck it. His name is Kevin now. And that became the scene. And then that opened up another door later on where I was like, Oh, how do I make the Kevin thing work? And blah, 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 blah. Because there was nobody in the script named Kevin at that point. (laughs) And it became a reveal later on that a character was using a different name at some point. And then his, their real name was Kevin. And that's how that played out. But people have pointed out, they're like, Oh, that's a really great scene and a really great twist. And da came from misheard song lyrics. There are so many things in Digits, in Haunted, in the scripts for Indom, all comes out of music for me that where I mishear song lyrics or if it's just coming from lyrics in general. Mm-hmm. If I even hear them correctly, I somehow my brain starts turning where it's like, oh, how do I how do I take that concept and apply it to whatever it is that I'm trying to build at this moment, whether it's a Halloween movie or a a karate fight movie or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And somehow my brain is able to process that and it works. Like I, I like nine times out of 10 people just look at me funny. Like how the fuck did you get that from that? And I don't know. (laughs) I'm not on drugs. I'm not drunk. I'm not, you know, sleep deprived. I'm not like my brain is working normal, normal, normal. And that's how I get, that's my muse. So whenever I hit some kind of creative writer block, I'll try and listen to music that I haven't heard before. Like th- that's the key is that the, and that's the, the hardest part is finding music that I haven't listened to yet. That's mm-hmm. worthwhile to listen to. Cause I've got to be feeling the song. Like the song has to carry like a mood and a tone that is in line with the, the genre or the subject sure. that I'm actually working on. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like I can't listen to like a Rob zombie song while I'm listening to, or while I'm writing in uh, uh, you know, an inspirational go get them karate movie. It's just, it just uh, you know what I mean? Like that, yeah. those two wor- worlds don't don't mix well. Um, but that's that's where I get a lot of my ideas. 
I'm curious to know for you, because I've been reading Trailer Park Warlock, and when I read it, as as an audience member, but as an artist and as someone who knows you, I have no idea where you're getting these fucking <laughs> thoughts from because I'm like, because and that's one of the beauties of it, too, is like and this is what I realized when I was coming up with that question for you. For me, it's it's a tribute to me to be able to do that with song lyrics and come up with these things for plots, because one of the most important things is to keep your audience at arm's length so that they don't get ahead of the plot, the story to yeah. know where you're going, what's going to happen, what you're doing. So having that weird side angle where I come in and I interpret things differently is an attribute to me. So I'm curious to know for you, for trailer park warlock, where do you pluck these ideas from? Because even for me, a fellow artist, I like, I'm just like in sure. awe of, I'm like, uh, how does he get there from there? Cause I could never do that. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the season. Like, the first season was really heavily inspired by a lot of Cartoon Network shows that I've been Hmm. watching up to that time. Um, So, like, the three big ones were um, Regular Show, um, Adventure Time, and Steven Universe. Those three were shows that I was like, I don't know, I guess there were some other ones in addition to that, but... I had, uh, up to that time, right before I had moved to Portland, I had been hanging out with a friend who was just, like, watching a bunch of, like, of those shows sort of, you know, back-to-back or whatever. And they were all really well done, really well made. And it was kind of, like, in my opinion, that particular, I think, I want to say that was 2008 to 2012-ish, or maybe even a little later. Um that particular point might have actually been the high point for Cartoon Network animation. Like they were really letting like their creators kind of just do whatever they wanted and even kind of like really skirting the line as to like what was acceptable for, (laughs) you know, like kids, quote unquote, kids cartoons. Sure. Like there were several that they made rated PG, which was surprising for Cartoon Network because like, it's very much a kid's channel. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, so anyway, a lot of the, particularly a lot of the humor from regular show really rubbed on me or left a mark on me. And like, I just really wanted to make something that combined um, sort of a, a sense of normalcy and like humor and normalcy, but then also combine that with my interest in the occult and my interest in like, um, what quote unquote real world magic or whatever, you know, Mm. like ceremonial magic and kind of making that into, um, it, it ultimately led to me building a world off of it. Cause like everything after that is sort of me trying to build that world out. And so like, like I said, depends on the seasons, You know, like season two, the inspirations for that one uh, was mostly me actually working through a lot of emotional trauma. And Mm. that one was probably that's probably my most personal personal in terms of like everything that's kind of the muse for it is just me dealing with stuff that was going on internally and trying to like put that out of me, you know, into the story and in my way of trying to like deal with um deep emotional problems uh i know that for there are a lot of people that's like their favorite season um and for me that one was probably the most difficult one to write but also probably the most rewarding one to write um that seems to be a trend i think a lot of artists would agree that things like that when you go through a lot when you're actually creating art it ends up being rewarding i don't know if it's successful is not the right word i mean it is successful on that level um Oh, it was the your... least successful season numerically, but oh, okay. like creatively for me, I still look at that season and go, you know, I actually really knocked it out of the park. I felt like, you know, That's like awesome. I, I really pushed myself to a place I did not expect myself to go. So, yeah, well, I mean, you're talking to the guy who <laughs> who made a movie about his life at that point in time. And there were times when I was writing the script and I was like in tears, like yeah. it's just fucking weird yeah, yeah, to, for sure. to sit there writing stuff and feeling it and the emotion in that time and working through issues that you're having. You know what I mean? And 
yeah, to some extent it's cathartic, to some extent it's masturbation, to yeah. some extent, you know what I mean? It's all of those things, but eventually it makes for powerful art. And I think that's really what's important is that the the art is charged, right? Mm-hmm. Because if, it, if it's coming from a place of, of boredom and complacency, that's usually what it's felt by the audience and the artists. So like, I know a lot of people who draw and they are very capable at twisting the lines and curving things and making things look quote unquote good, but they don't really care about what they're drawing in that moment. And the reaction to it is nothing. You know what I mean? Like people are just like, Oh, that's good. And then they move on. Whereas somebody might look at something and go, wow, that, wow. Can I buy that? You know what I mean? Like those kinds of things happen more, not always, but more when you dive in as an artist to whatever it is that you're particularly working on. Uh, So you weren't like lifting jokes and storylines from Cartoon Network stuff, but you were in essence riding the wave of that style, right? Yeah. That you were ingesting in that, in that particular time. Because like, I know when I wrote digits, I was big time watching the office and community. uh, You know what I mean? Those were the kinds of movies really, that I was really. That's also um, a really common thing, I think, for any kind of artist in that first project place is like, OK, what are the things I really like and how do I want to incorporate that into what I'm making? Because like, yeah, in digits, mm. like there is a huge influence of stuff like The Office in the sense of the like the the faux documentary style, like the kind of the delivery of the dialogue, too, in a lot of ways, you know. Mm. Where it's naturalistic in the sense that it feels like you could just be watching it through a camera rather than it being staged, right? Right. Like, but people don't really talk the way that they talk sure. in the movie. It's sure. it's very well hit. And you know what, what What the other second most influential thing was at the time when I watched that was Arrested Development. Oh, yeah. Seasons, seasons one through three. Yeah. You need to clarify that. Uh was a big influence on it. And I don't think like there was times when people didn't, there were people that were involved in the making of the movie that had not watched Arrested Development and were very much trying to just keep doing the office. And I was trying to explain to them, I'm like, (laughs) no, you can't ad lib this joke because I'm going to cut from this scene immediately to this other thing. Right. And they didn't understand that because that was a very Arrested Development thing versus an office thing office thing was you just make the joke here it is maybe you cut to a talking head and then that's it arrested development you know you cut you somebody says a line and then you juxtapose it to uh uh, an image that completely contradicts what just happened and that was that style of humor so it was really kind of the love child of those two television shows but anyway i'm getting off track well i never lifted jokes yeah. The only things that I lifted were a couple of quotes from my favorite movies like Hocus Pocus and Scream 2, but I don't think you could say I I stole yeah. from Hocus Pocus and Scream 2 to make digits cuz completely irrelevant to the plot and the characters. <laughs> no, I mean like the things the things that I took from the shows that inspired me were just like the methods, like yeah. how they built like the um how they built the story. Because I, I, after watching all those different shows, I was kind of like seeing a pattern in how um, they did the methodology of putting things together. So like, there's all there's often like pick a motif, right, and then you build the world around the motif. So like, um, one of my favorite examples of this, and I didn't mention, was this cartoon called Chowder, and it was a really unique cartoon in that um, it's very like. It was like this, you know, fantasy world sort of crafted out of uh, what if the, the entire world was just sort of cuisine based. So it's like all the characters are named after different dishes. They have sort of personality traits that are a little bit and maybe inspired or whatever. And it was such a like an oddball way of doing things. That it, I was like, oh, okay. So like, I wonder it, it, what in other in what other ways could I have could I apply that sort of idea? Because uh, it's an idea that's similarly used in a lot of um, Japanese animation mm. or in a lot of Japanese manga, uh, especially like what's called shonen manga, which is sort of like the Japanese equivalent of like maybe superhero stories. 
they will pick these motifs and build the world off of these mo- motifs. Like the probably the most popular example still running today is One Piece, where One Piece is about like pirates. The whole thing it's like Pirates of the Caribbean, but everybody's also like has superpowers. So like <laughs> it's 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 kind of a nuts like story because it's been going on for like twenty years. It's one of the most wildly popular stories in the huh. world because it is like read by millions and millions of people. And um in it's uh you know the guy who made it Atro Oda, like he just has a very interesting creative mind in the way that he approaches building that story out. Because within that motif, he has characters that have their own particular particular motifs that he kind of builds them around. And so um, that's a pretty common thing for a lot of different creators. And that really inspired me to kind of think about character creation, character design, and just like ways. And in some ways, it's kind of a shortcut in a, in a, in a certain way, uh, because, I mean, real life humans are more multi, you know, multi-level you know, like having a character where their entire thing is just about like they smoke or whatever, you know, it's just like yeah. it, that's like you're picking a tag and kind of building off of that tag. Okay. Whereas, you know, something that you want to have to be more three dimensional, it's like, oh, that's an aspect of them. But there's more depth to that character, maybe linked to their background or whatever. And that's something that I. I know for myself, I wanted to try and build off of when creating characters in Trailer Park Warlock, where I wanted to give them sort of backstories and, you know, think about them in a very in-depth way, which curiously, something I'm becoming aware of is attracting a lot of people who are into Dungeons and Dragons. So, like, a lot of people who are into tabletop role play really like Trailer Park Warlock because I think they, they, I guess they see elements in it in the later seasons that sort of, inspire them in that way so interesting now i have another question for you and we dug into this a little bit i don't know if i i don't remember what you said or if you said anything at all or if we even really touched on it but in our 420 episode we talked about whether or not using substances to create was cheating and i'm (laughs) curious to know because like i said it trailer park warlock is outlandish to me you know what I mean? Like it's yeah. very, it, it's just not something that my brain would ever come up with. I don't, I don't see myself having that gear to, to think creatively in that respect. A lot of my stuff is much more grounded. Uh, and, and this, you know, even coming from a place where I'm writing a, a horror monster movie, everything in that is very grounded. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's not, it's not fantastical in the, in the slightest bit. And I'm not saying that all fantastical things come from substances or whatever, but I'm I'm curious to know, have you ever used substances at all to kind of either beat writer's block or to or or, or had an idea that was worthwhile? Like, I'm sure you have ideas like because I because I'm not going to out you, but I know you you have dabbled in oh, yeah, certain yeah, yeah. things. For and sure. I'm curious to know, do you ever find yourself finding fruitful ideas coming out of those particular quote unquote sessions. I don't know. I mean, uh, I really have been pretty straight laced for a while now. And I feel like I haven't. Yeah, there is stuff for sure. You know, fruitful stuff, not just like random ideas that come to you and you're like, that'd be cool. And I feel like everything, though, for me is random ideas that I just catalog and put somewhere like I file somewhere in the back of my brain. And then like, oh, that'll be useful for later. And then there's a point where it becomes useful for later. Um, And I'm not I can't really think of any particular points when there was just like a big like. Uh Aha. Yeah, like like all my big story ideas kind of came from kind of hitting at something over and over and over again Mm. until like it finally solidified itself. So like I'm going through that right now and in writing my next story. And I've I mean, I at this point I have like five different totally unique story ideas I could go with. 
and I keep getting more. And it's very annoying because it's like, oh, this would be good. Oh, that would be good. <laughs> and as sooner or later, I'm just going to have to pull the trigger and just say, oh, it's going to be, you know, this one, you know. And, and I'm getting to the point where it's like maybe it's irrelevant which one it is. I just need to go with one of them instead of like, you know, worrying about which one is the best one. In like the Muse for the most recent one, most recent idea I had was just like – Thoughts that started popping up while I was exercising, you know, like I like that's the where big, I get a lot of mine. Yeah, the big point was like I was swimming one day and there was just like all these thoughts suddenly kind of came up over this one character that I've been that I've been working on because like I uh, something I've been doing over the course of the last couple of months is just making character designs and. When I'm making the character designs, I have backstories for them. I have, I, you know, how they interlink with each other and stuff like that. And there was one character design that I've had for a while in the back of my head to be in the next story, but as like a secondary character. And when I was swimming, I was like, well, what if he was the main character? And then suddenly, like, everything started to click in. Like, oh, the story would be like this. This would happen. That would happen. It would change everything completely. Mm. But, like... um it's i still haven't gotten rid of that idea it's been sticking around for a while so it's a very strong one you know and that that becomes another big part of it because i think um useful advice to artists if you ever have those big like epiphanous aha moments you know we're like oh this is the idea let it sit around for a second give it a couple of days and if it's not there later on Maybe that means it's not as strong as you think it is. Like put I've it. Had, <laughs> what are you saying, Joe? I've had that same approach where people talk about just the ideas in general. I don't even call yeah. them the big ahas, but like if my my usual practice is like people will say, "Oh, if I didn't have a notepad next to me when I'm sleeping, if I wake up with a good idea, I write it down." My brain is always telling is is either lazy or genius, and that I, my brain says, "No, if it's good, I'll remember it when I wake up." I agree it's not, with that. It, it, I'm not going to bother to write shit yeah. down because if it sticks with me, it's worth yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. And that's usually usually when I have the big ahas, as you as you pointed out with the uh, you know making that that character the main character or something like that, that becomes a snowball rolling down an avalanche for yeah. me, and yeah. that just kind of gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger because. Like the other day I was thinking about Cemetery Sweethearts and for the longest time I'd plotted it out that um, the the main male character um, die, or did not die. So the opening scene was going to be the main male character, the, the rough plot, it's about ghosts that fall in love in a cemetery, but they're, all, they're from two different eras. Um, the main character is a 1950s greaser and the opening scene was him leaving a party drunk and he gets into a car crash he doesn't die because that would be the expected thing mm -hmm. and then he kills somebody else though in a, in a car crash in that instance and then he takes his own life and one of the big things that you hang your hat on for the story is that it's about people who are unwilling to make changes in their lives uh, and like transitioning to the next part of their life, which is yeah. echoed in his love interest, which, be, which ends up being a trans woman from modern day. Uh, and the whole idea of crossing over to the other side, the afterlife, you yeah. know, leaving the graveyard. There's a whole bunch of ghosts in the graveyard and they just they're unwilling to cross over. And it's all about transitional things. And for the longest time, I thought to myself, OK, so he'll be at a party with his girlfriend and. You know, I guess he's I got to find a way to echo that theme of not making changes in your life. And maybe he's not going to go to a college. And it was really fucking boring. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> this whole setup. Sure. It, I mean, it worked. It worked. Yeah. And I was like, all right. And that's and and I was very attached to that's how it's going to open. That's going to how it's going to hope. That's how it's going to open. And then for some reason, I don't know. I don't remember where it jumped into my head. There's that game. It might be from Greece because that's what I've, I've looked to. And I haven't watched Greece in a while, but I feel like this was in the movie. Correct me if I'm wrong. But I thought about 
in the 1950s, I was thinking about the idea, you know, what do fucking kids do to keep themselves interested? They didn't have phones and internet and shit right. back then. Right. And I thought about it and I was like, well, what if he is playing a game of chicken? The game where people to drive two cars at each other and whoever's the, the, the chicken will be the first one to veer. Right. Yeah. right. Is that in Greece? Um, I'm I don't not know. sure. I think okay. it is. <laughs> I might be asking the wrong person. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been a forever since I've watched Greece, but I Same. mean, it's very much a 1950s thing. Yeah. yeah, and that's that might be why I'm associating it with that. But anyway, it occurred to me in that moment, I was like, well, wait a minute. The fucking game of chicken is about someone who's unwilling to make a change that they yeah. drive straight at. So I keep my car accident and it's a little bit more actiony it's more grabby it's more interesting i hit that that point quicker like and i'm yeah. a, i'm a big champion of this when it comes to writing it's which is that wonderful uh shakespeare quote brevity is the sh- uh is the soul of wit yeah. where you know it, it, that applies to me where it's like hit the nail on the head and keep fucking going so instead of having this long drawn out scene of talky 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 at a thing guy and a girl arguing about going to college and then he gets in his car and he's drunk that's very fucking boring it, it it accomplishes what i wanted but it's boring yeah and i thought well what if i just start the fucking movie with him in a game of chicken like that that is it's a that, great way to open a movie yeah and, <laughs> it, and, it really dies. Is, and <laughs> that's and that's literally the, and it, and it yeah. exemplifies without preaching the yeah. thematic point so i'm already establishing that baseline and then i started thinking to myself well how do i set up that he had a girlfriend because that's important later on and the all that other stuff and i'm like well wait a minute they're gonna be fucking ghosts stuck in this one location the entire movie a graveyard it needs room to breathe right yeah and i was like well fuck if i kill him off in the first scene like that then i can just do flashbacks because he's gonna have to talk about his past it's kind of like prison in the graveyard it's like oh what'd you do to get here and kind of kind of thing so he's gonna have to go back into the past and tell that story to somebody Mm-hmm. That's a perfect break from the graveyard. It's a breath of fresh air. And then, so the point that I'm making is I had that aha, right? During the research mode. And that's another place where I do get some ideas is where I get some, most of the time when I'm doing the research, I'll see something and then I'll think of something completely else. So like I was doing the research or whatever. And it was, uh, I think the thing that popped in my head was a driver or that I saw in the research was a drive in drive in movies. Right. And that's where the car thing kind of popped in my head. Yeah. And then I took it to the game of chicken. But the point that I'm making is that I had that aha moment and then it started building to, oh, the flashbacks will get us out of the graveyard and I can do that for both of the characters. And then I, that'll that'll mix up the plot a little bit. So it stops being just so mundane and they're ghosts the entire time. And it's not as pretty to look at. Like I can go to different eras. I can go back to the 50s. I can go to now when she before she died, like all these kinds of things open up the possibilities expanded and it stuck with me. And that was just like, OK, I'm excited about this now. So yeah. not only and I'm sure even you can tell from me talking about how I was originally setting it up, my voice cadence was probably lower and I was probably droning a little bit more. And the second I started talking about the game of chicken, my voice went up and I got excited. <laughs> and I like that energy carries just through the pitch, let alone when I sit down to start writing it. So yeah. that was one of the things that I think I, I, a lot of artists need to do is when you find something that enthuses you, like you're excited even though you don't know how it's going to work, because like I said, I had that whole thing set up about that party and then the, he kills somebody else and then he kills himself. Like while that was already established, I, I have to be willing to let that go yeah. and grab the lightning that's, when I see it. That's honestly, I think that's the most important aspect is to be willing to let go of ideas that you you may initially feel are like, you know, million dollar ideas and just be willing to let go of them because while ideas are not cheap necessarily they are they are they come you know what i mean like they come and go and you have to be willing to sort of accept the nebulous sort of aspect of ideas while they float around in your head because even 
even as you are more solidly like writing a story, you may come to points where you want to allow your character to grow or you want to allow things to happen that cause your character, you know, like your main character or your secondary characters or whoever to change. And all that requires a willingness on the part of the creator to like not cling too tightly to what is already established because it is Mm. so easy to do that. And like, that's something that, I mean, for various reasons in my, my, in my own life, I'm learning about like, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of strength that comes from not clinging too tightly to things and allowing change to happen and allowing, like allowing yourself to kind of go through those transitory moments because yeah. everything in life is like that. And so, I mean, uh, applying it to your own art allows, it, allows, I think, allows it to have that aspect of life reflected as well, you know. Would you say that a lot of those ideas that get, that get removed once, once you've thought of them and started working with them and then stuff, and then you come up with a better idea and you remove them, I don't say they necessarily go in the trash, though. Nine times out no, of ten, no. they end up going in the recycling bin, if you catch my drift. You, yeah, yeah. It's parallel where it's like, oh, that idea was working. Oh, it yeah. needs more work, but I can find a way to f- make it fit either somewhere later in this or on something else. You're 100% correct about that. There are definitely – most everything gets recycled in some way or reused or modified, you know? Yeah. Like I – I at this point I'm kind of forgetting that process because I know that I've done it with Trailer Park Warlock, but I can't I can't remember the track you know for like how that happened. But I, for you, Joe, do you have any do you have any specific examples for things where you were just like you ended up putting it away for a while and then it came back and you're like, oh yeah, I could totally use that for this story. Yeah, I mean I think I think I've brought this I've I've outed myself on this before, but I was working. After Digits, I tried to do a, a horror film called uh, The Devil's Hour, which was basically Hocus Pocus, <laughs> but but done seriously. Yeah, in in a in a in a, in a way, uh, it didn't pan out. Then I went to a Christmas movie, which I really want to do at some point. I really want to do. I have an idea for a Christmas movie, and it's been percolating for a couple of years now. But this is not that movie. I have a different movie that's a Christmas movie in my brain. But at the time, I started working on a movie called Christmas People. Now, this movie was interesting (laughs) because what I was doing was trying to do something business-wise and mix it with the thing that I wanted to do, which was a horror movie set at Halloween. So Christmas People was originally set as the people who are obsessed with Christmas Mm -hmm. stepping on the toes of the people who are obsessed with Halloween and kind of a war breaks out between the two. And it was much more home alone ish than Uh. it was, than it was uh, like fantastical. That being said, there was uh, one particular character in it that was quite fantastical. And I've, I think I called I just called him the Reaper, which it was a Grim Reaper, and he had a flaming scythe, right? And he would be able to walk out of this like portal and take people back with him and stuff like that. It was really kind of fucking scary for a Christmas movie, but you know, you look at some of the Christmas movies, you know, um, a Christmas Carol and shit like that, and yeah, there's some there's some dark shit. Long of the short, I could not figure out a way to make that movie work. In terms of what I wanted it to do, tonally it was a mess. I just didn't have the capabilities of executing it at that time. I don't even know if I could do it now. Maybe. I think I'm a little bit more seasoned now where I could figure shit out and make it work. But point being, I had that character. Now, fast forward to when I'm writing Haunted. This is based off a nightmare that I had. I started writing it where I was like, well, okay, every... Most of our artists that are listening to us are familiar with the concept of a ticking clock, right? Where if you want to add pressure on something, you need to add a ticking clock. So I have characters who are walking through the woods on a haunt, right? Visiting various scenes and setups where shit's happening and to them. But it occurred to me early on, it's like, well, if they start questioning whether or not this is life-threatening, right? 
why wouldn't they just sit put? Like, you know what I mean? Like, just say, okay, let's all just hang here and not go any further in the middle of the trail where nothing's happening and we can wait till daylight and then we'll we'll all go our ways or get out of here, whatever. And I needed something to be pushing them. So a ticking clock was kind of out because I don't know what really the ticking clock in this situation was helping them. If they drew out time, all they got to do is just it, that saves them in essence. Yeah. So what I thought was, I'm like, well, I need to to kind of have somebody pursuing them. And I was drawing on all of my favorite things, vampires, werewolves, ghosts, and, you know, all this kind of shit. And one of my favorite things, clearly, as I'm wearing a T-shirt right now, is like <laughs> Halloween, Michael Myers, Jason Voorhees, like the serial killer types or whatever. These motherfuckers, that just walk. They follow you. And I had for the longest time like a Jason Voorhees, Michael Myers type that was set loose after them after 10 minutes when they started on the trail. So I had a little bit of a ticking clock. Then 10 minutes goes by after they do the first scene, second scene. And then they hear like a horn go off and they know that that character has been unleashed onto the trail behind them, pushing them forward. So they can't sit tight anymore. Yeah. I had it basically as Jason Voorhees. And I was trying to come up with a million different weapons that he could have because jason voorhees has a giant machete michael myers has a knife freddy krueger's got the fingers so i'm like i don't know should he have like a a fucking bear trap should he have a um a mace do you know what i mean like i was trying to come up with all these stupid things yeah and in the course of those those days that i was trying to figure it out i was cleaning my office and i came across the stuff for christmas people and I saw the Grim Reaper with the flaming scythe. And I was like, motherfucker, perfect, <laughs> perfect. That's what I, and, and it fit the iconography so perfect because I, it, in any horror movie, even like Final Destination, there is no actual Grim Reaper physical form, right? right? right, right. The, the, the hooded and with the scythe and everything like that. In any horror movie that I can think of, I or worth noting, I can't think of any single one that has a Grim Reaper. Yeah. And I thought, well, that's perfect. That's my icon. That's my iconography. That's the character who can slowly walk behind them and force them forward. And it fits like this idea that I was working with. Well, horror movies, you know, are all dealing with death, but, uh, you know, avoiding death and this kind of stuff. Is it real? Is it not? It was perfect. So I was like, boop, drop, dropped it right in there. The opening scene of Haunted is the exact same scene that opened Christmas people. <laughs> <laughs> we should tell you all you need to know. Um, where, and I, this is spoilers, I don't care, it's the opening scene. The opening scene is about uh, a home haunt on Halloween night that scares a little kid to the point of like, they're traumatized, like crying, crying, gripping their parent yeah. screaming for it to stop like the person goes too far now in christmas people <laughs> it was an accident it wasn't intended to traumatize the young child in haunted quite the reverse that was the intent of the character and in christmas people the 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 main character was like that's it i'm never gonna do a home haunt thing again in fact i'm just gonna put up christmas lights on halloween and give these kids like a safe space to come and visit in, in in the midst of all the, the evil, scary stuff. And that pissed off the Halloween people, and that started the plot. In this movie, it's quite the opposite, where the person just wants to do it to traumatize kids. The point being, that that scene was, was trash. It was garbage when I gave up on that script. But then I was able to repurpose it, boom, right here, in Haunted. And it's perfect for the theme that I ended up coming with, is, you know, is this real, is this not? Yeah. The fucking main character is doing that to another character in the opening scene. And you know what I mean? Like all of those pieces started to fit in. So I was like, okay, Christmas people never materialize. It never happened. It probably never will. But these ideas. Andrew, this, here is your reminder. Charge my headphones. Oh, I forgot to charge my headphones, guys. <laughs> charge my headphones. Oops. Oopsie. Oh, well, I'm not even going to edit that. I'm too lazy. But I think that's a good point to cut me off where I reused something and those, those no, that's two a great example right there. though. Yeah, that's a great example cuz I'm I was trying to see if there were any examples still in my in my mind but I really I really don't have any tonight. Um 
I, I will... have very similar characters in things like Garage Raja and Trailer Park Warlock. The characters have some similarities. Do you know what I mean? Like the, the core similarities. Would you say that you see some echoes? Do you mean like in personality or in design? No, in design, like you design, you have your own style. Like I, I see your style. I could see your style. No, and well, like, I was oh. going to say in design, there's actually some things that Jake has similar to a couple of character traits uh, with one character named Reginald. Like I, I basically borrowed Reginald's hair and put it on Jake a little bit. But <laughs> in terms of personality, um, yeah, I mean, I could see it. I think... I do think that there are certain themes. There's certain, there are definitely themes that I reused or that I augmented from Garage Raja because a lot of the themes were developed by Austin for Garage Raja. And like something that I came back to, and something that me, a theme that me and Austin kind of both keep going back to is this idea of like, being caught between two opposing forces and sort of being in this middle ground where you yeah. don't really care. I see you that. Don't, yeah. Don't really care about how things turn out. You just want to like survive and have your own, you know, have the things that you want in your life rather than worrying about like what these two sides want. That's very much kind of what I was getting at. Yeah, because I can see those similarities popping up a little bit here and there. And it's not like it's a rip off or anything, but the the way I would describe it is the way I just did, which I would say echoes where yeah, for it sure. kind of it, it bounces off a wall and it's not as I don't want to say not as strong, but maybe not as prevalent always. But it's there. It's definitely felt it's acknowledged and it kind of comes through. So the the question that I think that I'm mining for here is. I don't know. Was there things that were left unresolved for Graj Raja that you felt you had to, that, that, or not that you felt you had to, but that you were able to materialize in Trailer Park Warlock? Like, did you, you know what I mean? Or even in, is there, because I feel like, and then on, on the flip side of this coin, you have Bat Monster, which is out there, as you said, and you know, it's completely different from Trailer Park Warlock, but is that things that maybe you come up with during Trailer Park Warlock and you're like, this will never fit here. Let me just stick it in Bat Monster. Bat Monster. I feel like Bat. Well, because Bat Monster's finished. Um, I feel like Bat Monster was just in a lot of ways for me, draw from a drawing standpoint, just like exercise. It was just like me okay, trying so no things out and just seeing what would fit together um, without really worrying about what the end result would be. In Trailer Park Warlock, I think definitely ideas that were used in Garage Raja getting augmented and sort of like retooled, um, retooled in ways that I that worked better for my own particular tastes and what I'm kind of wanting to go for. Because um, I definitely, I know I've talked about, I think, I can't remember I've talked on this show before about this, but I've talked about this before where because Garage Raja was never finished, I've had this sort of thing where I want to have the feeling of finishing something kind of big, some kind of big epic adventure and trying to get that out of my system. Like I, I think in a lot of ways I'm still sort of writing off the fumes of like being a kid reading the Lord of the Rings for the first time and like finishing the final book and being like, Oh my God, I spent like a year reading this fucking thing and I'm done. And it was such a, and then thinking back on it and being like, Oh my God, there was so much that happened in the story. And there was so many different details. And I mean, I like, I like stories where like later on I'm thinking about them still in day to day life thinking about the things that might apply to my own life or whatever, you know, those are the stories that stick with me the longest. And, um, you know, in some way I'm trying to replicate that in trailer park warlock. Um, I'm trying to, and if I keep doing stories in that universe, we'll probably still try to replicate in some sense or another. And then also probably try and contradict in some other way, you know, for Mm. stories. Um, I've definitely been thinking about story ideas where it's like, oh, okay, this is the the exact opposite in tone, 
or maybe not necessarily in tone, but in sort of scope, you know, we're yeah. like, here's a story about big things and big ideas. Well, here's a story about small things and small ideas, you know, to counteract it. Um, we'll see where th- we'll see, you know, it's kind of one of those things where I may find myself in a position where if I already have expectations established in my audience, I might just go with those expectations for a little bit longer. <laughs> And Do you find out. I'm curious because you were talking about this a little bit with Bat Monster and you were just kind of touching on it a little bit here, but do you find that doing exercises like just or or just like as you've you've frequently called it doodling, um do you feel as though those can kickstart the muse, the inspiration? Because oh, yeah. I I mean I have before where I've done exercises like I so I have haunted, but I wrote a short prequel script to it called Terror House. And when I was rewriting that one point, I realized there was a whole lot of dialogue. Oh, <laughs> so actually, of dialogue. That's so I lot stripped of it all away. Get, but, that's where a lot of the ideas get reused in Trailer Park Warlock right now are things that kind of started as character design ideas in Bat Monster. See, okay, where, so it was the reverse of what I thought. <laughs> yeah, where it's like there will be care because there's so many, there's so many little gag is not the right word, but just so many little pieces or whatever that yeah. I threw around when drawing Bat Monster. Um, where I was like, I kind of like that idea, but I didn't really go that far into it, and so I expand. There's a character design in this last season for a monster that's built on. Uh, kind of a motif that I reused a lot in Bat Monster, which is like usually some kind of ball monster thing with a big eyeball. Uh, there's several characters like that in Bat Monster, and so in Trailer Park Warlock, I have another kind of iteration of that idea because that's just like a it's like a character design iteration that I kind of go back to, and I want to find new ways of messing around with that idea. So that's definitely like one big example for me. I love that. That's and yeah, that's I think that's kind of what we're getting at here is that I think an artist is going to do what an artist wants to do. You know yeah. what I mean? And then that's yeah. what we end up. That's where the real creativity comes from is trying to figure out how you're going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> where it, it it checks all the boxes or as many boxes as you can uh, with one or one or particular thing. All right, so I guess we've kind of touched on this enough. Uh, Unless you have any other places where you kind of use to create from, like, do you have any go-tos when you hit a writer's block or anything like that? I mean, the thing that I I would just be repeating myself, but the thing that I would say is having some kind of, and it doesn't have to be one single thing, but having some, maybe some set of exercises or formats where you can kind of just throw stuff out there and carelessly create without any like end results or expectations. And then that can become your, you know, your, um, your resource pile that you can pull from for, for, for ideas, you know, like that, that's kind of the area where you can just sort of have your raw material, you know, for building your stories from. Pretty good. All right. Well, I guess that's that. There's no reason to drag this out. (laughs) Uh, Thank you all for tuning in, and we will talk to you next week. Good night, guys. Later, y'all.